So let's pray and ask God to bless our time. Lord, we thank you. God, I thank you for the men and women in this room tonight who are um, investing this hour of their time for the next eight weeks so that we can have a better understanding of the Old Testament. And Father, whether we're new in our relationship with you or, or whether we've been walking with you for 30, 40, 50 years, there's so much that we can be reminded of and be encouraged by simply taking a step back and looking at the beauty of, of your redemptive plan from the very beginning, how you were faithful to individual people, to a nation, and how ultimately through that nation, your faithfulness is on display in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. So God, we just ask you to allow our hearts to be open, God, our, our mind to be sharp and fresh. And God, I pray for myself to be clear in my presentation. We want Christ to be made beautiful, even in the Old Testament. And we are so thankful that you have condescended yourself by speaking to us, that we are able to have relationship with you, that you still speak to us through your word. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Um, my name is Brian. Um, I'm married. I have an eight, almost 19-month-old beautiful baby that's right there who's showing off because she doesn't have a problem being the center of attention. Um, my wife and I moved here about a, just over a year ago. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law is back there and my sister-in-law, but my, my, my wife's family have been members here for 35 years. My father-in-law is on staff here at First Orlando. He was IT director for 30 some odd years and now he is a director of business operations, something like that. He oversees, you'll never see him, he just makes sure everything gets done at all the stuff, all the buildings, everything, security, you name it, um, he takes care of that. Um, my, my background, I was a student pastor for five years, the last 10 years of my life. I've traveled the country speaking at youth events all over the place, from, from the middle of nowhere, Mississippi, to um, you name it, I've been there. I've done anything from senior adult revivals to pulpit supply to chapel services for preschoolers. And so that's what I've done for the last decade. I'm wrapping up a uh, PhD in biblical interpretation from uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Um, that's been a six year process now. And um, I'm in the dissertation phase and uh, by God's grace, hopefully that will be done October 1st of this year and I will walk in December and finally be done with, with school. Um, and so the last few years, I've been an adjunct instructor for New Orleans uh, Seminary online and, and back in Louisiana when we were living there for the past few years. Um, so my main thing is I, I love the Lord. I love my family. I love this church. I'm grateful for uh, being here and I love God's word and I just love equipping. I love being able to train and equip and encourage people with the word of God. Um, and so here at our church, um, I get to spend time on Mondays with Pastor David, uh, part of the um, sermon preparation team. And so I get to study the word with Pastor David, and you know this, but let me go ahead and say it again. He is an amazing man of God. He is the same person in the pulpit that you'll see anywhere else. He loves people. He loves the Lord, and um, he is sharp as all get out. I think you know that. And yet with all of that uh, incredible intelligence, he is able to communicate so clearly, so well, week in and week out. And I'm thankful for just the last few months that I've gotten to spend being able to part, be a part with him and uh, Pastor Chris Ogden and, and Jimmy Knott and be able to sit in and study uh, with them. And so that's just some of the things uh, that I get to be a part of here at our church. So with that in mind... We're going to jump right in. We're going to start on page five of your study guide. Hopefully there are page numbers. Last time I taught our how to study the Bible, we didn't have page numbers, so that became very, very tricky. So we're going to begin on page five with just a simple question. Why should we study the Old Testament? And here's some common myths that you've heard. And we're going to kind of run through these kind of quickly, but I want you to think about this and how this impacts us on a daily basis and how we hear these things and how you've probably thought this, maybe not said it out loud, but you've probably had these same types of questions. So the common myths that we see, the first one, the Old Testament is insignificant. I've heard people over and over and, and you've probably heard people just get me to the Jesus part. 
Get me to those red letters. Get me to some of those miracle stories. I know I've heard these things about Jesus walking on water. I, I, get me to the Jesus part. When I get to the book of Numbers and so-and-so beget so-and-so, I don't want any of that. I don't want to walk through Leviticus where they're, they're killing all these. I don't, I don't know any of that. All the prophets confuse me. I don't know who they're talking to. Just get me to the Jesus part. So some people believe that the Old Testament is insignificant. And I pray at the end of this class, you'll understand if we don't have a good grip of the Old Testament, then we don't understand the significance of who Jesus actually is. The more we get a grip on what God has done and how he has worked his redemptive plan throughout the Old Testament, the more we're able to see who Christ is and how beautiful it is his incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas time, his life, and then his death and his resurrection, which we celebrate during the Easter season. So some people think the Old Testament is insignificant. Other people may say the Old Testament is irrelevant. That's your second blank. Irrelevant. These things don't matter. What's the whole point if there's this Levitical law in, in the book of Leviticus where there's sacrifices to be made and specific things that they had to do in certain rituals? What's the point? I live on this side. I live in grace. Good thing we don't have to slaughter doves, right? We're good with that. But there's still significance. And so too many people think that it's insignificant or it's irrelevant. That has nothing to do with my life. Or even think about this, all those chronological, those genealogies that we read about, or even in, in 2 Kings chapter 2, what's the point of Elisha when he's being ridiculed by teenagers screaming, calling him bald man, bald man? I find that very interesting coming from a youth <laughs> pastor background. And he calls a curse down on him and these she bears come running out of the woods and maul the teenage kids. What's the, I'm not going to answer that question right now. You can go and read the story. Second Kings chapter two. So some people go, what's the point? Who, that doesn't even have any relevance whatsoever for my life. I like to tell young people don't make fun of bald people. And that's the best way to interpret that story. But we're going to get into some of those types of things. So the Old Testament, some people believe is insignificant, irrelevant, or maybe inconsistent. You've probably had friends, whether they're believers, but most likely you have friends who are lost, who say things like this. I'm not so sure about that God of the Old Testament who's always bringing war. That God of the Old Testament who always seems to be vindictive towards groups of people. What would a God of the Old Testament who seems always angry at the children of Israel, I want a God of the New Testament who's full of grace and love. Friends, there's only one God. And so when we think about this and people think, well, there's these inconsistencies, the more we understand the Old Testament and see the revealed character of God, the more we're able to bring together some of those inconsistencies and have a little bit better of an answer when people ask us those types of questions. For example, you have probably heard people say things like, well, you eat shellfish and that's an Old Testament law. You're breaking the Old Testament law. Or you wear um, a, a shirt that is a cotton poly blend, and that was against Old Testament law. So you're living in sinfulness, or you can't say this. Everybody picks and chooses the scriptures that they, they, that they want to, to, to live by, and somebody does this and somebody does that. Well, if we don't have a good understanding of what the Old Testament is trying to teach us, what's it trying to point us to, and what Christ has done for us to help us understand the Old Testament, then we're going to go, uh, should I just wear sackcloth and ashes, right? What, what am I supposed to do with that? So people think that the Old Testament's insignificant, irrelevant, inconsistent. And the last one you see right there is incomprehensible. Many people are just simply confused. And I hope more than anything, more than anything, you walk out of here after these eight weeks absolutely encouraged that the Old Testament can be understood. And that with just a, a little bit of time in the, in the work of the Holy Spirit in our, in our life and with some resources, we can continue to grow in our knowledge and our understanding of how the Old Testament works and what's the message of the Old Testament. So I don't want us to use any of these things. In fact, what I want more than anything, as you see right there, the central message is that the Old Testament is absolutely invaluable. It's not insignificant. It's not irrelevant. It's not inconsistent. It's not incomprehensible. We can understand it. 
The Old Testament is invaluable for our lives today. If we abandon the Old Testament, we abandon the revelation of God and we hinder our ability to actually see what's being revealed in the person and work of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. 1,600 times the New Testament authors quote directly from the Old Testament. Do you understand that that means that if we want to get to the Jesus-y stuff, we really need to know what Jesus was reading and what the people that surrounded Jesus understood as Jesus walked the earth. Are you with me? Yes. Have you heard these before? Have you thought these before? Listen, I've been to school for forever, and sometimes I go, mm, do I really, really need to know all of these Levitical laws? But let me encourage you with this. When Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was facing temptation, and he was in the wilderness, what was it that he did to battle temptation? And do we know where he quoted from? Anybody? It does have to be Old Testament. It rhymes with Deuteronomy. Just to help us out. I was challenged by David Platt, who is the author of this curriculum. Um, this is called a secret church material every year. He does a giant simulcast and teaches for about six hours. And the background behind the material is he taught... Uh, in a secret church environment overseas where it was illegal to really share the gospel in an underground church. And he just kept teaching, and they said, well, tell us another thing. Teach us the whole Old Testament. He just went book by book by book, and he came back to the States and said, I've got to put all this down. And he began to share it. But I was challenged when David Platt was teaching through Old Testament and through the uh, How to Study the Bible curriculum just like this, and he said, what if... Your spiritual success this week, your spiritual life and its success depended on how much you could quote the book of Deuteronomy. And some of us are thinking, that's a book? Oh, where is that? It's my first hesitations. I don't even know. Okay. So if Jesus quoted, Jesus who could speak at any moment, speak against temptation who could have said anything at any time chose to use Deuteronomy to be able to combat temptation how much more should you and I understand the word of God how much more should you and I not simply say well let's just go to the Jesus word well Jesus is quoting directly from the Old Testament and so I want to challenge us that this is not insignificant. This is not irrelevant. This is absolutely vital to our spiritual growth and our spiritual success on a daily basis. So if we don't get what the Old Testament is teaching us, then we're not going to understand the fullness of who Christ is and what he has come to do. God has not wasted one single word, which means even when we're tempted to kind of gloss over all those things, there's even a purpose for so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. God has an intention and a purpose for that being in his word. So how do we study the Old Testament? This is coming in the middle of page five. How should we study the Old Testament? Examining three different dimensions. So we have the literary dimension. It's the first part, literary dimension. In other words, the Bible is a piece of literature and it's made up of all different types of genres of literature. And so when we come to the Old Testament, just the same way that we come to the New Testament, when we come to Scripture, it's important to understand what type of genre of material we're dealing with. So when we read through the book of Genesis and it's primarily historical narrative and you just see story after story after story, Sometimes that's easier than reading the book of Psalms when there's a lot of metaphorical language, when it's poetry and action, and you're going, wait a second, I'm not exactly sure. This thing is doing, I, I, don't, I don't get all that. So we enjoy often, we enjoy historical narrative a lot more than we enjoy some of the other aspects of the Old Testament. And so what we have to do is when we look at the literary dimension of the Old Testament, what it does is it helps us interpret by being able to say these are the rules to reading this type of literature. 
You don't read the phone book the same way that you read a love letter, correct? You don't read a menu the same way that you read a fiction novel. You don't read a nonfiction book the same way that you come about some fake news on the internet, correct? And so we have to filter all these types of things through understanding the genres of material that the Lord has used through his inspiration of the Holy Spirit to be able to communicate the truth of his character and his redemptive plan that he wants us to understand. Is everybody with me? Is that good? So keep that in mind as we go through this. And so that's a lot of what we want to do is we want to say, well, well, what are these genres that we're going to be looking at? What are the rules for interpreting these genres? So it helps us more and more understand what God's trying to communicate. So that's the literary dimension. The second dimension is simply this, the historical dimension. Friends, we're dealing with real people, real history, real time. We don't believe that these are made up stories about people who never existed. We believe that this is the word of God communicating not only truth and truth propositions, but giving us a detailed account of how the Lord is working throughout history. And so with that in mind, there, there are things that are going to help us understand where Abraham is living, how he's journeyed from certain places, what's going on, who are the Pharaohs, where are they, what's the culture like, why do we see God raise up a group of people out of one little area, an insignificant group of people? Why does he choose one man? What's going on with all of the different gods and all of the, these different places? When you understand that Egypt worships all sorts of different gods, and you recognize that when God sends the plagues upon the Egyptians in the book of, of Exodus, and each one of those plagues are battling directly against one of the known gods of the Egyptians, it makes the entire story incredibly beautiful. That God said, oh, you think that's your God, Egypt? Now let me send this. Oh, you think your God can do this? Now watch what I can do. Oh, you think your God has the ability to do this? I have all power. And so that historical and cultural dimension helps the, the word come alive to us. Does that make sense? You with me? Yep. Yeah. All right. Literary dimension, historical dimension, and theological dimension. This is not just a story about a group of people. But friends, the Old Testament and all of Scripture is a story of God working in history. So we don't have every single recording of every single movement and every single group of people. What we have is God at work in the lives of people. And we're seeing the history of God on display. And so sometimes we, we want answers to questions that the Bible never intends to, to, to ask or answer. So we have to keep things in, in mind that, that there's a theological dimension as we read through Scripture. We want to see what it is God is trying to teach us through His Word. It's not just a book of facts. It's not just a book of, of propositional truths. But the Word of God is revealing the character of God and the story of God and how God is working to redeem His people. Are you good? You good with that? Yep. I'm, just getting, I'm getting fired up. It's hot. I'm going to start sweating. It's going to start rolling off my bald head. It's going to be great. So bottom of the page, what is the Old Testament? The Old Testament as literature. So we're going to dive into this literary dimension. The Old Testament as literature. The Old Testament is a collection of 39 books. 39 books. Do we want to try it like when we were in Bible drills? Do we want to go through them? No, we don't want to do that. This kind of turns into ABCs like my, my daughter. It's a la 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 P, right? You're getting some of the minor prophets. You're not exactly sure. But traditionally, traditionally, these 39 books are classified according to their genre, okay? So that's what you have. That's your blank. 39 books classified according to genre. These are the different types of literature that we have. We have law and history and prophecy and poetry. The Bible, these 39 books, is rich in its literary form. That's your next blank right there. 39 books traditionally classified according to genres, and they're rich in literary form. What that means is even within those genres, there are, are subunits or subgenres of different types of material. So you see right here, there's things like this, historical narratives, laws and statutes. We have prophetic oracles. We have genealogies. Your next blank after laws is songs. We have wisdom sayings. 
We have laments. We have an entire book named Lament, Lamentations. You read through some of the Psalms, and they're Psalms of, of lamenting, of, of seeing things and being distraught over what's happened. We have apocalyptic visions. That's your next blank. And many, many other forms of literature. So that's just to give us a, a broad understanding or a broad introduction that when we come to the Old Testament, we can't just read it with this one narrow focus that it's supposed to do this, this, and this. We have to look at it and go, I really need to understand what kind of genre is happening here? What kind of material is this? When I read the Old Testament law, it's not the exact same thing as reading one of the Proverbs. When I read Old Testament law, it's not exactly working the same way as the historical narratives. And all of that is going to help us understand when we come to interpreting God's Word. So knowing each type of form, each type of genre affects how we read it and affects our understanding. So the Old Testament is literature at the bottom of the page written by a variety of authors. But your blank right there is simply this. We have one divine author, God the Holy Spirit, inspiring certain men and women, recording and passing on from generation to generation the Word of God. Various human authors, predominantly written in what language? In Hebrew. And some of the Old Testament has been recorded in Aramaic. There's 267 verses in the Old Testament that are in Aramaic, primarily in the book of Daniel, chapter um, 2 through chapter 7, and then in the book of Ezra, chapter 4 through chapter 6. And then one other uh, verse in Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 11, is in Aramaic. So 268, 269 uh, verses in Aramaic. So if you flip over to page 6, not only is this one divine author, author with various human authors, but the Old Testament was written over a span of a thousand years. The earliest parts of the Old Testament were written somewhere around 1500 B.C. And then the last parts, chronologically, the latest parts were written somewhere around 400 B.C. And guys, these are obviously broad numbers. Some of these are not going to be exact. We're looking at general time frames. But over a thousand years of recording the scriptures. And most of that, our understanding comes from how we date the Exodus event in the book of Exodus. So the Old Testament written over about a thousand year period. The earliest around 1500 and the latest somewhere around 400. And so how did we exactly get the Old Testament? And what's going on with all of this? And so underneath that question right there, what we have, the information and the documents that we have, were collected into what's known as a canon, C-A-N-O-N. -N. Now, the word canon really just means as a standard or a measurement. And even in that, lots of folks say, well, there were books that were left out here and there. And the truth is that that's absolutely correct. Even in the New Testament, there were multiple books written, most of them after our earliest Gospels that we have recorded in our New Testament, very similar to the Old Testament. But there were standards that we look at and say these things most likely are not authentic. So, for example, and this isn't the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, based on who the author, were, uh, author was, in our New Testament, almost all of our books are associated with somebody who actually saw Jesus or walked with Jesus. And so that's one of the standards by which we say, okay, anything that's written by somebody that's not associated there, we need to take a step back and take a look at it. If it was written in the 2nd or 3rd century A.D., it probably didn't come and have the right, all of the details exactly right as compared to those who walked with Jesus, who then recorded the things that they saw and the things that Jesus said. So when we use the term canon, we're talking about a measuring stick. And so there were different types of things. How are we going to include this? And a lot of that was who wrote it? Who was the audience? How does it fit into God's story and narrative? And so stories were passed down from generation to generation. And I don't have time to go into all the depths of the details. I may print out a sheet for you next week that shows you kind of when we believe some of these things were written, how these things became what's known as canonized, how in each phase we see the Holy Spirit guiding God's people to be able to record the stories of history. How many of you ever wondered how in the world 
whoever wrote the book of Genesis understood who Adam and Eve were and what happened. And if everybody but Noah died in Genesis chapter 6, well, I don't have those answers for you. I know you just wish I could. But most traditionally, as Protestants, we believe that Moses is the author of the first five books of the Bible. And so just to give you a snapshot of what many people believe, and through that, some people believe that God supernaturally revealed these things to Moses, everything in, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 through 11 and 12, and then the stories of Abraham in chapter 12 through 50 were kind of passed down from generation to generation, and that could have happened. But where did Moses grow up? Egypt. Egypt. Where there's a large, large, massive group of people, and these were not... Um, People who were not well educated. And what you find is that there are multiple stories over and over of creation. There are different types of creation accounts. There are different types of flood accounts other than what we see in Scripture. And some people then get confused and go, oh no, the Bible's not true. Oh no. But what it should show us is that there were always groups of people trying to understand the beginning of the world and what happens. And so you have to understand for somebody like Moses growing up in a culture that's educated, that knows all these stories, God could have easily told him yes. And those stories could have easily passed down. Either way, what we know is that for centuries and centuries and centuries, there were standards by which these stories passed down from generations to generations to generations. So I just want to encourage you, without going into all the details, I've spent too much time as it is. Understand that the words that we have and the stories that we have were what God intended for us to have. And I know more in the, in the New Testament than I can tell you specifically right now about the Old Testament. But when it comes to the New Testament, we have more assurance that we have as close to the original words that were first jotted down and more copies and more documents and more copies of copies then we can really say about most Shakespearean plays. The oldest manuscript we have of the New Testament comes from right around 100 AD. And that's a very two by two square of the Gospel of John of some verses. So I just want to let you know, not just Old Testament, not just New Testament, but we can trust that what we're seeing and what we have is the Word of God through all the translations, through all of the centuries. And I probably just bored you with all of that, and I probably confused you. But I just want to remind you that as these documents were brought together into a canon, into a, a group of documents, into this measurement that says this is the authoritative word right here that we're going to go and we're going to study and we're going to be a part of this, God used scribes, that's your next blank, to transcribe all these different things through the years. They didn't have Google. They didn't have computers. And so this word and these stories, as they were gathered together, these scribes would take hours and hours and days and days and years and years making sure they put one letter next to the le next letter to the next letter. There was a whole process of being able to translate or transcribe the Word of God. And then ultimately... The word that was in Hebrew was translated into other languages. To the Greek Old Testament, which is known as the Septuagint, the Latin Old Testament, which is known as the Vulgate. And eventually from those, somebody continued to pass that on generation and generation until we have it in the English language. In our How to Study the Bible class uh, that I taught last semester, we kind of walked through very briefly how we got our English copy of the Bible. And it's a beautiful crazy history of people, many people who gave their life. It was illegal to take it out of the Latin language and into the English common spoken language. And it wasn't well received by many people. And many people were claimed to be and, and, and convicted as heretics for simply trying to get the word of God into the spoken language of the people. So when I share the importance of this in general, I want to remind all of us that we stand on the shoulders of men and women who have gone before us, who have given their lives in order for us to be able to read this word. And let's be honest, not only do we have an app that has 72 million translations, but for most of us, we have copies of this. 
sitting on shelves, sitting underneath things over and over. And even right now, there is over 6,900 languages in the entire world and 2,500 languages don't even have a copy of the Word of God in their language. And, and I just want to remind you of the severity and the responsibility that you and I have and the weightiness of to not take this for granted. 2,500 language groups don't even have a copy in their language. And here in Orlando, there's an organization working to try to fix that, known as Wycliffe Bible Translators. And so I only share that out of deep conviction in my own life that I pick up my phone, click on the Bible app, and then get to Twitter, and then get to Facebook a lot more quickly. Double check my email. Start surfing the web. Go on ESPN.com. While I have an app, do you understand that? An application on my phone that I can type anything in and search anything, and it will pull it up in my Bible. There are people who went before us who would absolutely kill. That sounds bad. Okay. Who would do anything. <laughs> there are people through the history of translation who were killed so that we can enjoy the Bible in our language. All right. I'm going to get fired up if I don't keep going. So the Septuagint, your next blank. The Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. Sometime around 250 B.C., the Hebrew Old Testament was then translated into the Greek language. Okay, that's just a very brief history, and I'm sorry if I confuse you. There's so much that I could cover that, that I probably didn't do a good job with. So let's move on to when and where did the events of the Old Testament take place. You have a, a map on page 7 and page 8. You also have an Old Testament kind of historical overview on page 9. I've also printed something that I'm going to share with you by the end of the class. Just as we get to the kingdom, uh, Israel as a nation, and kind of how all the prophets fit in with all of that, because that gets confusing. Does anybody think that that gets confusing? When we don't know where anybody, who they're talking to, and who's Judah, who's Israel. I'm so confused. I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to have a copy of that when we get to that part. But all of this is supposed to help us and encourage us that we're talking about real people in real history. This is not some fantasy and this isn't far away. These are real people and God working through the lives of real people. So the Old Testament is a real story set in real history with real places, real people in real time. Those are your blanks. Real story, real history, real places, real people, real time. God's plan has always been to create a people among whom he could dwell and with whom he could be in relationship with and we know his plan was perfect in the garden and sin disrupted that. And all of the Old Testament is seeing God actively working in the lives of people to bring about restoration between humanity and himself. Culminating ultimately in the person and work of Jesus Christ himself. So when you hear that, when you think about that, understand that real people, real time, real history... But this is all God's plan of what humanity has broken through sin. God is already before the foundations of the world. If anybody's been in the small group in the book of Ephesians, right? Before the foundations of the world, God had a plan to be able to bring a broken humanity and restore them back in the right relationship. Can we just pause for a second and think how good God is? I would have zapped Adam and Eve in a heartbeat and just started right back over. You know what I'm saying? I don't even have patience with my daughter when she just wants an animal cracker. I could not deal with a sinful human. God spoke to them clearly. And yet they heard the temptation of did God really say? So keep that all in mind. So the Old Testament history made very simple. So here we go. Are you ready? We're going to go quickly. Old Testament history made very simple. In the beginning, there was nothing. That's your blank. And then there was something. Genesis 1 and 2. I don't have time to get into all the details. Were these 24-hour, literal 24-hour days? Are there gaps in between day 2 and 3? Where are the stinking dinosaurs? I don't have time for that. And to be honest, you don't either. Okay? 
These aren't bad questions to ask, but understand this. Genesis was never written to give us the answers to those types of questions. The point, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. We'll get to the book of Genesis in just a minute. But don't ask questions of the scripture that the scripture is not trying to answer. Get behind those questions as to what the scripture is trying to show us so that we can more clearly speak to people who say, well, I don't believe the Bible because I don't know when it. Just ask them. The Bible is showing us that God created that of nothing. And you want to know why? You want to know what sets this creation account differently? What's so different about it? from other creation accounts that were floating around other ancient Near Eastern people groups, the Mesopotamians, the Akkadians, not just God's chosen people, Israel. In all those other accounts, in all the other histories that people studied and believed about, there was chaos that happened. There were multiple gods. The earth was created because of fighting going on between gods, all these different things. And yet here, Israel's God, Complete control at all time. And he spoke. So when we read different accounts, is anybody familiar with the fact that there are other accounts of creation? When we read those account, uh, those accounts, don't look at what's just alike. Look at what's significantly different. That it wasn't out of all this chaos that something just randomly happened because these gods were at war. No, 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 no. Out of nothing, the one true God spoke and there was something. And that is huge for us to understand. So in the beginning, nothing than something. Creation, life, creatures, man is your blank, made in the image of God, Genesis 127. See that in Genesis chapter 2, God breathing into the nostrils of man. The Garden of Eden quickly becomes the location of the fall of man, Genesis chapter 3. But even in Genesis chapter 3, as we get to Genesis chapter 3, already gives us a foreshadowing of the grace of God. How he's going to provide a covering. Oh, I'm going to start preaching. I can't do it. Okay, okay, okay. Humankind degenerates for many uh, generations. Pretty much Genesis chapter 4 through 6, right? We go from a perfect Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, the fall in chapter 3. We have our first murder one generation later in chapter 4. And then chapter 6, God said, "Mm -mm," right? And he sends a flood. Everybody except for whom? Noah. Noah, right? Noah was found favor in the eyes of God. And so Noah and his sons and their family, their immediate family, get on the arky arky, right? And so built out of barky barky, right? And so they get on the ark. God floods the earth. Everything is destroyed. God gives a promise to say, I will never destroy the earth again by flood. Every time we see rainbows, that's not just a child story. Do you understand that? That's not just something we point out and we read and there's a flannel graph thing, right? There's none of that. Every time we see a rainbow, it is a reminder that God is faithful to his covenant. And God is faithful to his word that when all of humanity, all of humanity was jacked up and broken in the mess. God said, I'm still going to be faithful and I'm going to raise up one person. I'm going to protect his family. And from there, I'm going to continue to be faithful and I'm going to make provision because I'm about restoring my people to me. And good thing, right? Because every time you read in the Old Testament, man keeps screwing it up. Every single place you turn, we mess it up. So good thing that God had a plan before the foundations of the earth. That when man screws it up, he's working through the mess ups of man to bring about his plan for it to come to full fruition. So God judges the world with a flood, but he spares one righteous man, Noah, and his family. That's Genesis chapter 6 through 10. Even Noah is broken and messed up with his daughters, right? If you're on a chronological reading plan starting the beginning of the year, you should have been, you know, through this last week or so. Humankind rebels at the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11. God confuses their language. They weren't supposed to gather up. They were supposed to spread. They gathered up. They wanted to build a tower to reach up into God. And God said, no, thank you. And he spread them, confused their language. And then in Genesis chapter 12, a new beginning, God's faithfulness to a man named who? Abraham. Abraham. And God called him out. And guys, let's not be um, so worried about the term like election or choosing. God did choose one man. And he said, through this man... I am going to give you all sorts of offspring that you can't count. In your line, your family will be a blessing to all nations. 
And so God called Abraham out. And Abraham, as we see with his family, what we see from Genesis chapter 12 all the way through Abraham is a story of, Ab- uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 50 is a story of Abraham's lineage and all the people that come from his line. And so Abraham's prosperity turns into Israel's slavery. When we get to Exodus chapter 1, you know what happens, right? All of the heritage and all of the, the, the siblings and all the family of Joseph are in prospering and they're in Egypt area. A new Pharaoh rises up who doesn't remember who Joseph is and what Joseph did and said, mm-hmm, that's a lot of people who are not Egyptians and we need to do something about it so that they don't raise up and overthrow me. So he puts them all in slavery. For a long period of time, they're in bondage and they cry out and God hears their cry and what happens? God raises up a man by the name of floating in a basket, right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh baby, let my people go, right? In the Exodus, that's your next blank. The Exodus, Moses leads Israel out of Egypt. Somewhere most likely in the 15th century. Some people believe in the 13th century. But if you want to jot a little note to the side, probably 1446 B.C. is when the Exodus took place. I don't have time to tell you all the different nuances of who believes in the 15th century or the 13th century and all the archaeological data and how we get to that and arrive to that. But if you want to know, I can email you some stuff. So the Exodus, Moses leads Israel out of Egypt. They head to a place called Mount Sinai, right? So Exodus chapter 1 through 19 is God getting his people out of Egypt. All the plagues, all the stuff that's going on, crossing the waters, getting to Mount Sinai where he gives them his law. And so God gives Israel the law. That's Exodus chapter 20. That's your blank. God gives Israel a law. Then the people enter into the promised land. It didn't happen immediately, if you remember in the book of Numbers, right? They disobey. They're afraid. They're giants in the land. We look like crickets, even though this fruit is gargantuan. We have to carry it on poles. We're too scared. Caleb and Joshua say, no, take the land. They say, no, we'd rather go back to Egypt and be slaves. And Caleb and Joshua are like, no, that's dumb. And they try to (laughs) yell at them. And Caleb and Joshua are like, yeah, we're right, because we're the only ones who survive and all of you die. And so... (laughs) They wander in the wilderness for 38 and a half years, correct? Roughly 40, right? 38 and a half years. And then they enter the promised land. The people enter the promised land where they're ruled for a little while by judges. These are our books of Numbers and Joshua, Judges and Ruth. Somewhere between 1406 and 1050 B.C. Eventually, a kingdom is established. Saul becomes the first king of Israel roughly around the year 1050 B.C. And eventually a kingdom is established, epitomized by King David, is your blank, and his son Solomon. Is everybody with me or have I gone too fast? It's not a lot of blanks. I'm just filling some things in. Saul ruled roughly between 1050 and 1010. David took over in 1010 to about 970. And then Solomon ruled from about 970 to 931. Solomon built the temple of God. That's your blank. That's 1 Kings chapter 6. It's a home of the Ark of the Covenant, center of the people's worship. After Solomon dies, the kingdom divides into Israel. That's the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is called Judah. And we know over and over that idolatry grows. God says, don't. They say, "Mm -hmm." we'll keep trying to do it on our own. They worship false gods over and over and over and over. And then God sends prophets to them over and over and over and over and say, stop doing that. I told you, don't do that. And yet, they didn't listen. So God raised up a nation by the name of Assyria, which destroyed Israel in 722. So the northern kingdom falls in 722 B.C. Babylon then comes along and destroys the southern kingdom of Judah, ultimately in 586. So the people of God now don't have a home. Because of their disobedience, God said over and over and over. And he gave them chance after chance after chance. Sent them prophet after prophet to change your ways. And then God takes his people and he sends them into exile for 70 years. That's your blank. But God, because he is gracious. God, even through prophets, said this isn't the end. I will raise up a remnant of people. And even though you're in this place called Babylon, 
I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to put you back in that land. And that's when we get to a remnant returning to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which are closing out chronologically, closing out our Old Testament. Israel still longs for the glory it knew under David. Even when they rebuilt the temple, they were sad because they said, this doesn't even look like what we once had. What we heard our parents tell us about. What we know the temple that Solomon built look like. And there's a longing and anticipation of God When are you going to bring about full restoration to your people? And the Old Testament becomes a story that doesn't really have an ending. The people are waiting for a promised Messiah who the prophets talk about who is going to come back. He's going to show up and he's going to restore God's people. When you read this, when you think about this, I get overwhelmed knowing that even in their sinfulness, even in all the difficulties, God was faithful. And let me encourage you, we've just got a couple of minutes. Even in your stupidity and my stupidity, God continues to show himself faithful. And I pray in my life and for you, I pray that that doesn't cause us to think that we have a license to walk in disobedience. But it will cause us to fall on our face and simply say, thank you, God, that you didn't leave me in my stupidity. And that while I know that I've dishonored you and I, I know I've done things that displeased you, you still saw fit by your grace When I was dead in sin, you made me alive together with Christ. That by grace, through faith, I've been saved. Not of my own work, so that I can't take any credit for it. It's been a gift of God. His grace and the faith that I'm actively living in is still His grace at work in my life. The people longed for a Messiah. They longed for for somebody to set the record straight. They longed to feel like they belonged and were in right relationship with God again. And you and I, on this side, get to look back and go, every step of the way, God, you were faithful. And God, even with deception, even with man's sinfulness, even as they messed everything up, You actively worked in every single thing through your sovereignty to display your grace to your people. And we get to enjoy that grace because of what Christ has done for us. That is a good God. That is a God who is worthy of not just your worship on Sunday morning. That is a God who is worthy of your absolutely undivided allegiance and obedience on a daily basis. May we not be men and women who want to look at the blessings of God like the children of Israel did and then go on and mix our worship every single day by saying, you know what, I'm just going to do my own thing. May we be men and women who see the glory and the beauty of God and His faithfulness and we say, you have all of my allegiance, all of my affection, all of my attention. You have all of my obedience. And when I do fall, when I do sin, and I do something that dishonors you, I come humbly before you because you are a gracious God. And I seek forgiveness because I want to be in right relationship with you. I think that's all the time we have. We're going to jump in next week. Before you go, before you go, next week we'll start working book by book. And we've got plenty of time. Listen, I tried to do how to study the Bible in six weeks. That did not go over well. (laughs) So we've spread this out to eight weeks for this class. And I hope we get done early so that in week eight, you and I can have a conversation as to how to best put all of this into action. 
That's my goal. We may not get there, but that's my goal. So next week, we'll start on the top of page 10, and we'll start working through the book of Genesis, and we'll probably, you know, just get through the first five books of the Bible. Let me say thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. And if you know anybody who you think would benefit from being here, just to be encouraged by the Word of God, invite them. We'll, we're going to find a bigger room next week that's already on the agenda. That's not a problem. But I want to ask you, please, as best you can, what you start this week, let's finish together, okay? If you happen to miss, here's the good news. Dr. David Platt has already taught this 12 years ago. And you can find it on the internet. Now, he's brilliant. He was my preaching professor at New Orleans Seminary before he wrote a bestseller and became pastor of a mega church and then president of the IMB. But <laughs> he is one of the, if not the godliest man I have ever met in my life. He reminds me a lot of, of Pastor David in this, that when you have a conversation with Pastor David, you are the center of, the t of his attention. I have never met very many people like our Pastor David and, and David Platt, who when you speak to them, you are simultaneously convicted that you are nowhere near the person you need to be. And yet, <laughs> you leave more hopeful than you have ever felt in your life that the Lord loves you and that you can walk in obedience. And there are only a few people, I believe, only a few people who make other people feel that way. And I just want to be like that, and I ain't even close to that. And I was like, oh, I just need some of that. So if you missed anything, or if you happen to miss a week, or if you just want to point people to this study, Radical.net is the website. And go to the Resources tab and find Secret Church. And you'll find all the, the materials, all the resources. You can print out the transcript. You can listen to them. And it's in about 12 different languages. And just a, if y'all don't mind, can I take one more minute? Sure. Just, just think about it this way. The, the, the Gospel of Matthew, written by a tax collector, which is a beautiful thing, right? He's, he's betrayed his Jewish people to work for the Roman government. But the Gospel of Matthew is written primarily to Jewish people. This is why Matthew says repeatedly over and over, for you have heard it said, but I say unto you, the types of things that Jesus said, right? And he also says, so it would fulfill this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Matthew is constantly, more than any of the other Gospels, Matthew, because he has a Jewish audience, is saying, let me show you mm -hmm. all this that you already know. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus fulfills all of this. And so when we flip the page from Malachi and we go through a 400-year period of silence, but when we flip over, and we go from that last word and we open up the genealogy of Matthew. And you start reading through all these people from the Old Testament and you realize, huh, that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. We start seeing things like Ruth and Boaz. And knowing who comes from the line of Ruth and Boaz, that just two generations later is a little shepherd boy by the name of David. And then you understand why God has included this random story during the period of the judges of this girl who's lost, who's lost her husband and goes with her mother-in-law back into her mother-in-law's homeland. And there's this random man who's got all this money and all this land and they're trying to be kind of sneaky and a little bit shady at times, right? And you're like, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> You've got this kinsman redeemer foreshadowing what Christ does for us, but God is molding and putting all of this together so that from Ruth and Boaz, we get David, and then we get Jesus. God's got the whole thing rigged, and he is good to us. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you that in Christ, we have every single blessing. As Paul told the church at Ephesus, you have done all these glorious things before the foundation of the world. You had already predetermined how you were going to bring about salvation through Christ. And God, thank you that each and every one of us who turn from sin and trust in Jesus, we're in Christ. And by being in Christ, that means we have all of these spiritual blessings that you lay out in Ephesians chapter 1. And all of that is because of your, your, your grace and your goodness towards us. We don't deserve it. We never earned it. And God, I pray that that will, sh that will give us great humility. And I pray it will give us a great urgency to tell the people in our lives that are walking in darkness to come into the great light. 
God, bless each and every person in this room. God, give them a, a tremendous week to be able to speak grace over the lives of other people, to be able to open up their mouth and communicate to other folks how good you've been to us. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Hey, thank you, baby. She knows that one. She knows that one. Y'all have a wonderful week.